Hello, my name is Carolina Oakmans, and this is Living the Classical Life. Carolina, we are so thrilled to welcome you here to Living the Classical Life. Thank you so much for being here. For me, it's actually also a personal pleasure to welcome you yes. as a dear friend. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Same here. We've caught you at a very busy time, and you're about to uh, embark on a tour in mm -hmm. Europe. In Switzerland, yes. I'm fascinated by the idea on this show. Performers always wonder whether they're going to make it and yeah. how soon they have to make it. There's a sense of pressure, always. In the short time that I've known you, your career has suddenly taken off. What do you make of this, and what has that felt like? It felt fantastic. It felt also frightening, because you sort of wonder, will I fill the shoes that suddenly are so much bigger? Will I be able to uh, be conscientious as a musician, and not suddenly uh, follow a path that I don't believe in anymore? So that was a big thing. It is. Um, very much more work. I work much more than I used to. I feel there is no more hour that isn't filled with something. So I'm very busy, but I love that. I get to travel more, which is fantastic and exhausting. So it's everything just more of it all. And um, I must say I love it. And I'm excited to project growth into the future that carries on like this. Do you feel like it's difficult to maintain one's authentic self as we are going out into the public sphere in a greater capacity. I think artistic integrity also equates yes. with human integrity. Oh, yes. And so there is this sense of fright uh, yes. for, for me. Oh, yeah, very much so. I felt that very much so, that I don't lose myself, so that what I see on, uh, for example, on a film like this, is that still me or is it not any longer? So I basically promised to myself, if my integrity is not there anymore, I'm not on the right path. So I hope that 
what you see today is who I really am. There are certain artists who blossom later. For example, my own teacher, Sergei Babayan, mm -hmm. really saw most of his opportunities blossom in his 50s. Yes. But we all know that he was playing at the same high level yes. at the same oh, time. Yes. So do you think, in fact, that you would have been happier had the career blossomed earlier? You know, I do believe that there's a time in life for the right moves to be happening. Some maybe, I don't know, higher power, what you want to call it, where it's like if it happens at the right time, then it can happen. If it doesn't, then it's not going to work out well. For me, this was perfect because I don't think I would have been strong enough, confident enough, and maybe also not secure enough in my own artistic beliefs, I think. How do I want music to sound? And is that really, can I stand by that? And is that an, a durable product? Is it going to be there for weeks, months, years down the road? Or is it just a whim? And I'm a whimful person, I guess. Is there a word whimful? Maybe there is. <laughs> no, there is. So I guess, yeah, I think in the past I was like, oh, this sounds good. Oh, this sounds good too. But now I'm very much clearer as to what I want music to sound like. And that is that's now the time for me. I'm always wondering what is the nature of confidence. I sometimes wonder if it's an emotion that we feel. Is it something that we can turn on? The reason I ask this is with your increasing career now, I also sense as a friend that you are becoming personally more confident. Yes, and that's true. That is true. Confidence, yeah, that's really a, a miracle word, isn't it? Um, I have to tell you, and this is a bit of a, it's a private matter, I would say, but I'm quite willing to share that. Something that has increased my own confidence is um, meditation, believe it or not. A place that I can go to that is within me, that is very much my own and always there for me. So if I feel, um, uh, I don't know, jittery or kind of too high in, in nerves or like not centered, I can go there very quickly and just calm down. And that... I don't know what came first, where is the hen and where is the chicken, but I can say that the meditation practice I also started when my career started taking off. So I would highly recommend it. Do you suggest it to your students? Yes, yes. I do. I can't teach it, of course. I don't know how to, like, how to bring somebody else to that state, but I, yes, I, I do. So yeah, I at least recommend it, yes. Does personal confidence extend to stage confidence for oh, you? Yes, very much so. Um, it's all what it's you can't just walk from the street into a playing setup and then suddenly hope for confidence that has to be already there on the street it has to be there the day you get up the morning you get up it has to be there all the time and I think it's a it's a precious thing inside that you have to very much groom it is like something you have to got to take care of very carefully. And of course it gets blows. We all have blows to our confidence. No life is perfect and goes always great. But when it doesn't, you have to really turn inward and say, okay, confidence, how can I bring you back up and groom you today? I think that discouragement is something that everyone has to deal with. Yes. Are you conscious about the reaction that you will get, for example, with reviews? Um, poh. Another personal thing I would have to say, quite frankly, I've never been too worried what people think about me. It is more what I feel my artistry is like and if that comes across. So if there's a review that says, oh, she looked this way or she did that or so, that's fine, I can live with that. But if it's a review that said she missed the subject matter of that Schubert sonata, that Beethoven, especially my own repertoire, then I take that, that is, that is a time when you have to groom your confidence, yes. Let's say it's five minutes before stage time. Yes. You're waiting in the green room. I think this is a, a scene that not many people in the public can imagine. Yes. What is going through our minds? What do you advise your students? Are we focusing on our artistic mission as musicians or are we thinking of the music or are we just trying to get the nerves down? I think of the music and I envision the path to the piano. So I'm in this green room walking to the piano, walking to the piano, until I walk to the piano. That's basically what I do. And I like to pace. I think I've walked, I must have walked kilometers in green rooms. I walk back and forth and back and forth and imagine how I go and collect myself and then it's time to start. What happens in the rare, but certainly it happens to everyone, the instance where we feel 
there's the path to the piano. I can't do it. Oh, yes, I know, where you just think any other job would have been better than this one. Yes. And that very moment. I know, well, you look, you just got to do it. And the audience sweeps you away. There is that applause. It's like this wave that carries you to the piano, especially if it's enthusiastic, uh, where you just think, they're here to hear this. This is special. This is a moment that I have to now really do something with. Then it all goes away. You just start playing. You've been playing to sold out houses all across Europe. Yes. What is that experience like? Oh, European audiences are a bit different from American audiences, which are also a bit different from Chinese audiences. How so? Um, European audiences have a great background in music. So they will have heard the greats, they will have heard the current great pianists, and they will take comparisons. Is that intimidating? Yes. <laughs> so it's like, oh, I heard Rubinstein in the early 60s play that, and you kind of think, okay, <laughs> you know. Yeah, so they will draw the, the comparison, but again, that comes back to saying, did I make the right decisions? And if you didn't, maybe then that is a second guessing moment. But I think I'm trying to uh, make the right decisions with my piano playing, and then I can stand up to that, yeah. And it's then interesting, and you find out, where did you hear him? And, Oh, and in which hall, and what was it like, and, and that. Could that also be a matter of inspiration for you? If yes. you knew that your musical heroes played in this space, could that in oh, fact be the right energy for you? It is, uh, it's practically, it's almost a sacred moment, I would say, or spiritual. You go out and you think, this is where my Reyes played, for example, which happened to me. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps right now as I'm talking about it. It's like you walk out on that stage and you think, this is just, rewind time, just a few decades, and there it is the magic. I find that, um, yeah, inspiring, but also this is sort of like a spiritual space that is, yeah, very, very valuable to me. Carolina, I'm so glad that you brought up Myra Hess, because one idea that I'd like to explore in the show, we haven't done so in depth yet, mm -hmm. the role of women in mm -hmm. music. I know mm -hmm. that Myra Hess was one of the pioneering mm -hmm. female pianists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you were growing up, were you aware of any kind of distinction, whether you are fighting against a tide, whether this would have any bearing on your career tra trajectory. Look, when I grew up, Marta Argerich and still is, was my uh, heroine, my absolute goddess, and I got to hear her a lot. But she was the only woman. There's Anne-Sophie Mutter, who I heard, um, as this is all in Germany still. And um, these were the only women that you ever heard. I didn't think about it at the time. Maybe I should have, but honestly, if I now think back, it was maybe 95% men on those stages, more so than it's now. And th yeah, that was basically what it was. I didn't, I must say, I didn't think about it. I'm trying to put myself in your shoes in that position. Did that feel, so if 90% of performers are men, did that feel like exclusion? Yeah, maybe it did. I think at the time I took it that way. These were not, this might sound funny, but they weren't, it sounds probably really funny, they weren't so much men, they were pianists. So mm. I didn't see them in any gender connection. Mm. It was just like, here's Brendel, that is amazing. I even heard Kempf still at age 92. So that's like, these are entities. And the gender issue was a little bit in the background at the time. Same with Argerich, just the power of that pianism or, um, yeah, the depth of expression of Arau, and uh, th that, that is what drew me to these people. Not, I didn't think so much about gender, I would say. Carolina, if in one of your concerts a young girl were to be in the audience and afterwards were to come up to you and say, I really have admired what you've brought with your music and your persona, mm. and I would like to be like you, Yes. what would you tell her? A young girl. Um, what would I tell this girl? I would say, if music so pulls you in that you can't get away from it, then you must do it. But if it's just, I could do music, I could do engineering, and I could do maths, maybe not, because you have to have that to sustain you when the going gets tough. It has to be a pull that is just like against all odds always back to music. So if the love and the conviction is there, I would say do it. And I would then also say you've got to go full, full steam ahead. Believe in yourself. You can do this. But that has to be the driving power else. I think there could be rough times coming up. 
I've always sensed that you've had this full steam ahead power. Well. Were there ever any moments where No, you... there wasn't. There wasn't. I tried to fight music, you see. I tried to think, nah, music, no, I'm not going to do it. And very few people know that I actually went for a year to law school. Yes, I went to law school for a year. And torturously, I had to walk by music school every day. So one day I went to law school, so I thought, books packed, everything, and the worst part is I didn't even do halfway badly in the law school. So I went by the music school, this is in Freiburg in Germany. I don't know what possessed me that day, I just went into the building. I went into the building of music school. So I'm reading all these tags, piano, harpsichord, I remember, and I thought, wow. So I went and talked to the secretary and I said, I'm I think I might want to study music and now oh, this is difficult. From then on, it was like my life was just going from one spot to the next. I was very lucky. I had a lot of people helping me out and that was what it was. So I tried to fight this. So I believe if the pull is strong, do it. If not, or especially if there's a lot of, you know, early on, do the competitions, oh, practice another hour. I've seen that so many times. When the parental pressure is gone, that people fall into deep depressions because they feel maybe misunderstood or, I don't know, empty. So uh, I think that's a dangerous thing. That's a remarkable story. How old were you when this happened with the law school? Oh, well, I was out of uh, high school. How old is one? Maybe 19, something like that? Or 18? Yeah, that, I, honestly, I'm not so sure. But in that bracket, and I went to law school because my family is a lot of lawyers. So I thought, okay, well, that's what we do, right? Play piano on the side. And I had a piano and I practiced in the evening. It was very lovely. And I did pretty substantial repertoire, but I thought, yeah, I'll just do that. And then for the longest time, I've carried this as a secret because I thought this is like not so great. I should have been convinced that I wanted to do music from the get-go. And now I see people coming into this music market that do both. And well, like on super high levels of playing. And I'm thinking, well, maybe, yeah, it can happen that way. And so when you eventually chose music, did you feel additional pressure that you had to succeed beyond, was there parental pressure, Not at for all. example? Oh, to the opposite. Are you sure you would like to do music? How are you going to sustain yourself? These were the questions, the questions every parent asks, of course. I said, yes, I have to do this. I have to do it. And did I feel pressure? No, it was more like, yes, I'm now in the, in the candy store. I've, I've arrived. <laughs> That's how it felt. <laughs> Does a young pianist today have to be enterprising or entrepreneurial? in order to reach out to audiences. I know that you keep a blog, for example. Yes, I think this is much more so than it used to be. Um, practice alone in your practice room is a must, but by far not enough. You have to reach out, social media is big, internet is big, also networking is very big. And this uh, is a must for young pianists, uh, any young musician, maybe every young professional, I could imagine. It is very important to do that and to spend Set aside time on that even to say, okay, I've done my practice now and now it's time to work on my blog, work on my visibility on the internet, Twitter, whatever. Very important. What kind of repertoire are you most drawn to on stage? Um, on stage by others or by myself? Well, that's <laughs> Hearing it or playing way. it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with what repertoire are you most drawn to as a performer? As a performer, I'm drawn to repertoire of all that I love. Um, Germanic music, um, I love Chopin, I love the 19th century, which has fantastic music for the piano, of course. Love impressionistic uh, anything, practically. Um, I like clarity, clearness of texture. Um, I love structural tasks. For example, putting together Brahms' second piano concerto was a task that I loved because you don't only have the mammoth movements of that piece, but you also have to decide how they stack up against each other and how you make the thing a whole. That's 40 minutes that you have to actually make one. And that's a task that I love. And that, of course, is also there in the Beethoven Sonata, Haydn, Mozart, uh, but also later Schumann. Oh, I love Schumann. My mother is from the hometown of Schumann. So her piano teacher 
taught her practically only Schumann. This was like the local guy, more or less. And then she is my first piano teacher, so I learned my first pieces were all Schumann pieces. That was sort of like, yeah, and then you also play this. But what's your next Schumann? So I played a ton of Schumann when I grew up. I feel the language is something that I relate to. Is there any Schumann in the works with any of your recording projects? Yes, there is. Um, I, I recorded the Ghost Variations, which is a set of variations that are um, based on an incredible story. I'll keep this brief, but this is the last days of Schumann. And you might know um, that Schumann tried to commit suicide. That's right. And um, manic depressive disorder, terrible, uh, of course, at the time. And um, yeah, on the day when he tried to commit suicide, he tried to s jump into the River Rhine in Germany. And this was in February, so ice cold water. Jumped in, was rescued out of the water, brought back home, sat down and composed a piece. This piece then he dedicated to his wife, and his wife held it very close to her chest. She never published this piece. Pretty soon the piece was lost. The piece was lost for 150 years, until somebody sent an envelope to Henley Editing House, said, I think this is the music of Robert Schumann. And then they checked it on, I don't know, all these lab things they can do on authenticity, and it is a piece by Robert Schumann. It's his last notes. So I just couldn't believe it. This was then discovered in 92. A few people are playing it. It is um, core, it's a little bit core. I'll just show you the beginning. I cannot believe when you have just done what, you, what Schumann did, you come home and that's what you sit down to write. And then he writes five variations on this theme, but then it stops. He just he doesn't finish. So in my recording, what I did is I took this theme, I played the five variations, and then I played the theme again. And it's sort of saying, that was it. That is the end of my voice as a, as a composer. I find that deeply moving. Yeah. It's in the major mode, and yet it's so sad. It is. But there's also gratitude that yes. I hear in that. What is it about Schumann's music? Schumann has everything all at once, which I love. Happy, sad, angry, boisterous, suddenly deeply introverted, just to go and go crazy again. And that, I love that. And it's coming across in the carnival so nicely. But he interrupts himself, he writes a piece, and then suddenly he goes, oh, well, let's leave that for a little bit. Here, I'll go to another piece, and then come back to this piece, and then suddenly finish. It's whimsical, I love that. It goes to these early romantic, fairy tale stories and stories of people in Germany that sort of have miraculous powers a little bit. So you can suddenly disappear and then reappear. These kind of things. I love the whim of that. So there's a repertoire that you absolutely love. Let's say you're studying it. When do you know you're ready Ugh. to bring it on stage? Or do you have the liberty to decide? I be, I'm becoming more and more conservative with that decision making. Longer, longer, and longer do I study my pieces to make sure that it's uh, you know, congruent within itself, it's solid. My musical ideas have been thought through very carefully and then I try to go out and play. Um, depends on the difficulty degree, the length of the piece. I'm playing a, a few little Couperin sonata, sonatas, little Couperin little things with lots of trills and kind <laughs> of early fun with ornamentation. And they're shorter. That takes, of course, much less time than yeah, a cycle of 35 minutes like Carnival does. So is there a time? Not really. Some stuff comes quicker than other. Your husband is a composer. That's right. <laughs> what does he bring into your life, musically and otherwise? I don't want to start just sounding soppy about our relationship. It's a very good one, I think. Um, but let me, talk about, let me talk about the work with a composer, which has sharpened my realization of the importance to be true to the score and witnessing how much effort and actual real um, inner work goes into writing a piece makes me come back to a score, say by Schumann, and say, every note here has been written from the heart and from a person and needs to be respected and treated that way. So that's sharpened my uh, respect for the process of composition, not only to new music, but also to tried and true compositions. So if your career at this point is really taking off, what would you like to achieve with that newfound platform and visibility? I would like to give people hope. 
that a career can be blossoming to unexpected levels at an unexpected time in life. So it is not that if you've reached your, say, end 20s and nothing has happened, you might as well say, oh, it's not happening. It can happen. I would like to give hope to women in that position as a minority, if you will, on concert stages. But I also would like to say, um, I would hope to contribute with my voice, with my, with my playing to music and try to uphold this incredible art form. Carolina, thank you so much for being here. It's been such a pleasure and a delight. <laughs> thank you, John. Thank you, thank and I wish you. you well with your upcoming European tour. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> <laughs>